Okay, I'm trying to figure out why you cannot see this tire. There it is, there it is. This is the tire. This is sitting in the middle lane over there here on I-81, roughly around mile 196.1. Would have been 196 because we're coming up from the south. This is the tire that I hit in the middle of that road. And I gotta take that show and show you the damage that it made. Now I know why it didn't hurt my car. Look at how my car hit this. And it must have spun around over here. And because I'm in the dark, I didn't see this. That's the damage I did to it. Now, a piece of my car fell off. What it did, it hit the skirt and the underside of the front. It's a piece of plastic. The police, the 21 something officer, or well, the other guy, probably the same age, who, you know, all they knew how to do was park, didn't really have some like, real practical life experience, but no real experience. Said, oh, this protects the car. And when I figured it out, I was, no, it's just a decoration. <clears throat> it's protecting nothing. So if we can snap off that bad, it's protecting nothing. So, anyway. We did show a limited ability to reason. I kept that reminder. No, I did not say what you assumed I said. Pay attention to myself. I tried to play the game. I'm a professor, so we try to pay attention, look at the little details, and take the big picture apart. And we to up with it. So I figured this is about the right shape. Yeah, it was about. They filled most of the lanes. Well, look at how my feet are spaced. It's wider than that almost as wide as the car and that's what I felt. I just came out with the dogs and whoo, bam, too late. Uh, I hit it going 70 because that's the speed limit here. I was playing speed limit even. I hit this way. And now it's still what the car looks like and you're going to be really amazed. And see that speed, it's right up there already. And the police and they couldn't, now I know why. I careened that thing all the way over to the thing from the middle lane, all the way over here. God protecting me. This could have been super bad. But now, what I'm asking is, how did that tire get in the middle of the road? Nobody knows that nobody else had an accident. I mean, I don't even know how that thing even fell off and got into the road, and nobody noticed it. Fortunately, it was the middle of the lane, so it didn't hit anybody's tire, unless it's been hit before. I keep bouncing around this runway because I always pick it up, so at least it's off to the side. And I couldn't get the policeman to be curious enough to go look for it. It's fortunate that I do not remember the name of the county or say it, but you see this sign? We're going to see what we're close to. And the fact that I'm a mile 196 and somebody on I-81, mile 196 is in which county? You're going to know it. And if this goes on YouTube, Somebody's going to lose his job. It's somebody in the sheriff's department who was extremely unhelpful. I told him thank you in the end, but in, as I thought it through, my hitchhiker ditched me, claiming he's going to go up and get help. This is the humanity of man. So here we are, 30 miles from Stanton. They don't call us Stanton, they're Stanton. 120 from Winchester. Richmond's off in a different direction. It's over there, where these are up here. Stanton North, Winchester. I thought I was going to Charlottesville, which is intriguing. I look at my mileage range and I just changed my destination in my head. I think I want to go up to Alliance, to the brand newly renamed Alliance University. I'm from the Christian and Missionary Alliance by birth. My interest in Thailand was made possible that I went to Thailand. I'm a, I'm a professor of, of anthropology. Asia, so that all that happened because I went to Thailand in 1980, a kid who never aspired to anything really big, and I wanted to go back to Thailand as fast as I could, and didn't want to go to seminary to do it. Because since I was a kid, I felt called to go overseas, and didn't want to be a traditional missionary. I didn't know why. Play soccer, do anything. And that's what I've become. So it's taken a long time. So here I am in the middle of these trust falls God has been giving me the last two months. <laughs> I thought I was through them all. And now I'm going to go up to New York. As soon as that thought came to me, bam, there's this tire. And I didn't know what it was. I thought it was something big and far more solid than it is. So starting 30 miles, Winchester 120, Richmond 100, Richmond City, doesn't matter. I want to continue up to New York City the straightest way I can go. And I still don't know how to post things to YouTube, but that's, 
I want to see what happens. There's my car. The guy who sold it to me lied to me about his condition. I'm going to just put this out there and maybe somebody else is because the policeman who told me about it said they didn't know what that could have cost. A guy at a place called DNR Auto in Harlan, Kentucky, H-A-R-L-A-N. I've already been planning to talk to the county attorney about it because he mentioned the original stuff. And DMV said, we can't do anything. Try talking to the county attorney. And it's his job to find somebody who's cheating, lying, breaking the law. They go after him. His, you know what? And uh, I don't know the result, but I already know that when he told me that the term rebuilt title on the warranty that says as is rebuilt title just meant oh i passed inspection no that thing was trashed so badly you can never pass inspection i have since learned from from dmvs in virginia that when it comes time to get my title the process is so difficult it'll take forever and what's more that car has no trade-in value. Another deal is checked into the Kelly Blue Book. It has no trade-in value whatsoever, Mr. DNR Auto, happy boy, who looked very, very nice and trustworthy. I, it never occurred to me that anybody would ever be this. What's more, it shows up somewhere, and it, even this is in his paperwork, out of state. He never mentioned that out of state. What state? Even more. I didn't know where the VIN was, or I might have found this out myself, but still, I wouldn't According to the police, I, I, I'm not sure if I remember this right. This is the police here near whatever town I'm near at mile 196.1. That's what that little green thing says. 196.1 on I-81. They get higher as you go north. Actually, northeast in the case of I-81 in Virginia. Because we're shaped by the mountains. And uh, it's that and behind us is Virginia Tech side road to, to Virginia, and I thought I was going to you, Virginia, the Cavaliers, and the Virginia Tech Hokies, uh, you know, I'm not from Virginia, but I watch sports, so, <clears throat> back to this story, oh, I was going to show you what the front looks like, here we go, sorry, sometimes do that, I do, and I just let them stop, if it's important, it will come back to me. sitting here I've been making SOS signs with my phone with the light flashlight on I put my practically white sweater on the hood with both hood and trunk up nobody stops I've never seen anything like this all I can think is maybe God is just telling me to trust him so in one part I said you know do it I put the hood down put the trunk back down got my umbrella out because it's going to start and I've been walking now I've been pacing nobody stops nobody thinks anything strange here nobody thinks anything strange here that's funny. I'm smiling as I say this. I, it's like, I didn't think this was possible. It's completely... Nobody's going to touch me. It's the middle of the night, 2.30 a.m. I've been here for two hours. The, the tow truck says... That place says the tow truck's going to be here in 30 minutes. About 30 minutes? Why so long? No, no, he's the only guy. He's, okay, I can deal with this as an owner. Apparently, he's a bad owner. Doesn't want any business. Or maybe he figured out somehow that I have no money and wasn't planning to pay him. But I don't need to. Because take a look at this. My Dodge Avenger, which has no trading value whatsoever, and that guy wants to pick pick up $250 a month for a car that needs $4,000 repairs minimum. And we're finding more stuff all the time. Why is the gas mileage so bad in cities? Uh, it was completely. Uh, first person to tell me it was a dealer from New York, a retired dealer. Oh, it's rebuilt title. It's that was in a wreck. Not only a wreck, completely totaled, probably. Okay, I'm having trouble getting on my knees. I'm just going to put down there and see if you can see it. That's what fell off the car. And notice, this part's missing. And this is attached. This is attached. There's one bolt left, but I can't pull it off. If I do, another plastic piece saved. These American cars are no better than the Japanese ones. They are flimsy. That thing is purely for decoration. But because it's falling down as it is on the ground, I don't want to rip up my car. What's left of it? This car is great. It's running smooth. Now, 196. Police told me the next exit four miles up. 2.30 a.m. 63 year olds. But I have done some walking before. I think I'm going to turn off my flash. Just hope nobody finishes totaling the car by driving like crazy. And I think I'm going to take my umbrella. And start walking up to apparently exit 200 
Um, and I've been learning in this period of difficulty that I'm in just to depend upon God for the next right step. You see, as people say in 12 steps, just do the next right thing. One step at a time. God, let me know that step, and I don't have to know why I have to take that step. I don't have to plan, oh, I'm going to get this. And that's how my logic used to work up until about a month ago. So I've got my umbrella, which looked forever to get a good $20, and one time I had a little more money, got it. And it's been nice here because, okay, now I feel safe and secure. Lock it up the car. There we go. My strategy now, it's, it's the only thing I can think of because nobody's stopping, nobody's going to die. I'm, going, I'm not going to record the whole thing because I want this thing to load. And I'm going to put this thing up on either Facebook or YouTube or both. I don't even know how to do YouTube off of a cell phone. But when I had to go all four miles to get to a signal. My name is Dr. Re Professor Dr. Edwin R. Zaner, Z-E-H-N-E-R. Grew up with the Christian and Missionary Alliance. The thing, the place I think I'm headed is Alliance University. Just renamed, used to be Naya College. When I was a kid, my parents lived on campus because my dad was maintenance. That's my first connection. No, I grew up in the Christian Missionary Alliance. That's how I became a world aware person, was seeing the missionaries come back with the, what we call curios. Oh, oh, I'm picking up a little grad student. I had, I taught in Thailand. We had, we had monks as our students. <clears throat> and uh, let me just digress, because this is a fun story. Uh, my student, who was a Buddhist monk, he'd entered the monkhood at 13, probably because his parents were so dirt poor, it's the only way he could afford school. That's my guest. I've seen his house, I've seen his dad, I've seen his mom, and I'm not going to talk about it. And he's entirely unembarrassed by them. I think it's good for you, sir. Entirely unembarrassed. And they constructed for him, out of wood, planks and plywood, his own monastic residence. He technically have a, what we call a samnaksong, not a wat, which is the official monasteries, but a samnaksong, which is, you know, the smokes that get famous, they can start out, they get famous, they go off, and people start to find them. <clears throat> and next to that was his library with the extra bed. His library is bigger than my office. And this is a family that every meal was chicken legs. Chicken legs. Dad didn't work. Apparently neither did mom. No income. This super duper bright kid gets in the monk monkhood. And the first time we had a serious conversation in the office, I was trying to use introductory questions, figure out who he is, just trying to get a relationship going. And uh, I'm just piecing together a story here I want to tell you. And so I tell him, no, I ask him, what was that? Oh, one of the questions, uh, I was a monk, he's got supporters, I knew a little bit, I thought I was smart. And uh, I said, well, who's... Who is your most faithful supporter? I think my mom. Huh? <laughs> I just sort of laughing. I think my mom, yeah. Yeah, it would be mom. And it's probably true. Who, who built that stuff for him? And she invited a monk into her residence. I mean, this is the official language. Is Nemo and Pra. Oh, I invited them. That's not a term you use for anybody. That would be Chen Kao. But this is Nemo and Pra. Pra is the monk. Pra Nemo. Very, very complex word drawn from Indo-European languages into a Thai, which is a non-Indo-European language and has tones like Chinese, but is not related to Chinese. The real world's really complicated. And I'm having fun with this. I'm just taking it easy up this hill. And this is reminding me of that student. So, he lived in this poor monastery on the edge of the campus. So he put in his emails to me. This guy was just had a sense of humor like a streak a mile long. Uh, one time he said, I'm sorry I didn't make it to the office in time because uh, I didn't have a bike with me because monks can't ride bikes. So what he was starting to do, he did it on Facebook and then he moved to YouTube where he really got knows and people were like, this guy is wisecracking our entire religion to death. Uh, <laughs> and he's a monk. And he studied at almost the highest level of the Pali exams for the sacred scriptures. Uh, when I was going to preach in a church and I wanted to talk about the Lamb of God, I thought, well, 
to make this really relevant, I'll find out what the Lord, what promesto motos is. Everybody in Thai Christianity talks about Jesus Christ as a promesto, the Lamb of God. But they say promesto. What is the root of that word? And as it said it in the seminar room, it says, try him. He's studied a lot of Pali. And said, so, oh, this just means the child of a lamb. <laughs> the child of a sheep. What does it mean? Child of a sheep. And we had talked enough about religion, he knew what it was going to do with that. And so, and <laughs> I said, it's just a child of a sheep. Nothing, nothing special. But they add the word pro and they add the high language, it sounds special. And that's why they use it in the Thai translation of the Bible. The promise of God. Promise for the Kong Pajau. Pajau is God. Promise for the Kong Pajau. Pusong Satit Yu, Naipasa Wan, the Pandin Lo. He who lives in heaven and upon earth. Now I'm preaching to you right out of the Thai church. This is how they talk, and they get excited about it. In a country where only. See, 70 times 2 is 100. One out of 140 people is Christian. Protestant Christian. And that's way up from 40 years ago. One out of every 140 people is Protestant Christian. Completely unafraid to get excited about God in front of everybody. Maybe in America, we're afraid to even bow our heads and pray in a restaurant. We're afraid of offending people. Nobody in Thailand is fear of because they know they can do it. Nobody's going to give them a rip unless they're family members. And they can pray for each other with passion in public. And they know it's because in Thailand you don't do each other like that. The Buddhists and the Muslims have some trouble. You know what some of my Muslim students are saying? I, I want to do a little project down in Bhutani, right in the middle of the troubles, and start to keep starting up again and go back down. Starting. Is it about religion? Is it about that? We don't know because uh, Muslim majority provinces and they're ethnically Malay. And, and I got the idea. My students have been writing, and one of them is so pro and pro Buddhist, anti Muslim, talked about how you know, these Buddhist minorities, Muslim minorities they'd been moved into the colonized place and hopefully they could dissimilate and it didn't work but again is the insurrection about that or not nobody knows UK political scientist Duncan McCargo, D-U-N-C-A-N McCargo, M-C-C-A-R-G-A-O the best person to write about this uh, after this big on himself prime minister named all well, every type person knows who I'm talking about back in 2004 decided to have a drug war oh and decided that he's going to have his police run the whole thing area down there he's going to turn off this conflict with the police because these are just criminals no political subtlety needed and this guy was not subtle everybody had an opinion about him and the drug war is kind of like that guy in the Philippines that recently turned it over, the guy named D turned it off to, over to the guy, I think, uh, uh, maybe it's Minoy. I thought it was going to be a guy named P, but no. I'm trying to be very South Asian about this and not name names so you can focus on my message and not on me. So, my monk, friend, and this is just giving you context so you can sort of live this as I've lived it. And I had advantage, I had done my homework before coming. But even that didn't prepare me for the reality. So my monk friend, what's he going to do while he walks the two kilometer back and forth on foot from this little what long? I mean, it didn't even have an ah. What long is an abandoned mountain? Technically, it wasn't a mountain. Then it had some interesting images, and the nuns were still around sweeping it, but it had no abbot. <laughs> Which is perfect for my student. He wanted to find the little spaces in the middle. Him and this other guy who secretly secretly was practically running an entire branch of the Buddhist monastic university system while telling me never to let his fellow students know oh this guy's great never let his fellow students know that he had any position at all or they're doing and I said why not why wouldn't you want him to know I've only made it three tenths of a mile I'm still running away anyway 
you said, because everybody just assumes that monks are lazy, and I just wanted to think that. <laughs> and so I go off with him. He's inviting me up to his monastery. Oh, you know, my, I want you to be able to meet my abbot and all that. He's leaving in the smallest, only wo wooden guti, we call it, monastic residence left. One corner is filled with shelves in the ceiling, filled with books. So he's secretly a scholar. And next to it was, the, you know, across the street, go down the street a little bit to her left, and there's this thing that looks like dorms. This is the way the Taishu schools. That was a monastic university, which now serves both monks and lay people. And there's the library. I hope, Mr. Pasuti, that I can tell the story now. It's been long enough. I know you're no longer there. You're somewhere else. I may be sending a friend to go find you. We're going to find out where you are and say hello. And I may even have to say in Thai, thank you very much for coming down to help me in that hospital down in that, down in that certain province down farther south. And you know where it is. You were my angel. You were my angel. And... I won't say why I was there. Something really odd happened and through the cracks of a certain medical system. And I was unconscious for five days and at least four days later. But given what they said I had gotten, checking on the internet should have been 14 days. So I've actually talked to the better guy called him. We went through all the different positives and the guy finally said, I'm serious, this is an army doctor in that field. And in Thailand, the army doctor in that field are considered the best. And he finally said, well, I guess it's just going to be one of those things where we really know well, what the real cause was. I couldn't believe it. Doctors would say that straight up. We don't really know what the real cause was. So anyway, I'm in this thing. And I saw it coming on. Was it physical illness? Was it mismedication? It resolved in me gradually losing my mind. I said, oh, yeah, this psychotic break. Well, I did it and I didn't. Because to see it coming. But I stayed in a place where all these names... I was in southern Thailand, and I was processing as if I was in the border in Mexico, so everything that started with the M, instead of being the place names I knew, it was Mexico, not Malaysia, for example. And it kept going like that, so you could tell I was already off. And it was maybe because somebody put in the wrong meds, we thought I had Parkinson's, and we now know I did not. But we were exploring it because I had the symptoms, which may have been caused some of the very medications I was taking. We now know. We now suspect. I no longer had those medications. Uh, and I don't shake as much now. And But the students have noticed they reported in a very Thai way. I'm rambling from topic to topic just to keep myself from getting bored. Anyway, and these are all great stories. And they didn't go the way they did. America, the students, teacher, you're walking kind of funny. Everything okay? Oh yeah, I probably, I probably knew nothing would happen. I think the entire way we're fed. What happened was my younger Thai colleague, trained in the America, he's brilliant. But he'd been made at the age of, I don't know, not even 30, the secretary. I, I said, look, you want people to understand what you are overseas, call yourself secretary general. That doesn't get the idea. You're not some scribe, you are running the place. I was chair for about seven months. I was chair. Of, I was never allowed to do anything. Every time you get a, oh, it sounds like a job for the secretary. <laughs> I couldn't figure out what to do. And he said, well, why don't you just sit down and think through what your plans were. I think now I know what this all means and I could make it happen. And this, if I knew how to show direction without being too directive, the secretary would figure out how to implement it. If he believed in me, he would make it happen. And I wouldn't have to do a thing. That's how it really works. Uh, I just didn't take all the credit, slap my chest, which I wouldn't do, actually. I'd say, oh, thank you all the people who helped us out, and it's a really good time, and uh, wow, we're really fortunate this worked out, uh, <laughs> and I think that's the way to do it. Uh, so, <clears throat> don't take credit. It doesn't work, not in Thailand. Don't take credit. If you want to be respected, don't bark at people, don't order people around. You just be nice. You just be nice to everybody. Be polite. Everyone first says they said the kids coming back. 
no matter for that, you know, all smart and everything. And so, but you got to be polite. And I thought, holy cow, she's just told these kids to buckle under the system for the rest of their lives until they become like the guys doing them. And I was, that thought was sort of correct. But at the same time, here I'm coming through this in my soldier in America. Yeah, it's not just these guys. The problem is they're coming back and they're probably being arrogant. That they think they know everything. Because they went to school in the United States and maybe they're... Maybe the superiors did not. And they know English backwards and forwards. Maybe the superior does not. And in time, you got to be polite. you got to respect that guy. I mean, you don't have to like him. you got to respect him in public. Or you will show yourself to be the buffoon. Now, not everybody in Thailand grasps that. Not even the Thai get this. And again, I'm an anthropologist, but it doesn't mean I got there through sheer reason or application or anthropological feel or, or the, the, the uh, notion of culture and the Foucauldian approach to this and that and the other thing. And oh, Derrida said, did it enough. Open your eyes and pay attention to all the mistakes you make and the others do. And why did this happen and not the other? What's the alternative way of reading this thing that might happen to you? Now that's being anthropological of real life. Kind of like the title of the course of the book, Anthropology of Life. That, to me, is beginning anthropology. From there, we can get complicated if we want to, but let's keep it simple here. Just pay attention. I don't know which story I'm on, and normally, if I was in the setting where I was talking, I'd say, could you tell me what I was talking about before I took the most recent digression, sir? And they usually figure it out. And then, oh, oh, yeah, I meant this. But now I'm about 15 stories deep, and it's something I have no idea if it's going to come back together yet. That used to bother me. Now I'm waiting to see what's the next thing I'm going to tell you about. So we've got me going to this hospital. Okay, we'll bring we'll bring the tea down. Before my sense of awareness completely disappeared, about 12 to 24 hours before that, I started thinking, maybe arrest is going to come from a completely unexpected place. Believe it or not, this is what I was thinking. I wonder which of my circles of friends it will be. And I started going out, looking out. And the people say, why did you keep looking and hanging upside down on the road? I was looking for the rescue team to come. And my completely, increasingly adult state looking for the rescue team to come. And it didn't show. So I'm out. And according to people who knew me, I was like, saying, keeping the whole world awake. And it, I was kind of doing it my own. I, I, was, I probably had... I, I thought this was a dream. I thought somebody else was being taken out of the stairs in the church. It was probably me. And this guy being wheeled through and he gets past him. I won! I won! <laughs> and, and I was imagining other people in that structure that I knew. This one guy has this wonderful beard and a great personality. And then I get in there, I'm singing, I'm counting, like, I'm going to help my daughter with something. If I can count forward and backward, if there were higher voices, I'm going to get this. You realize at this point, I am completely dreaming. Completely dreaming. I have no control over what I'm doing. Completely dreaming. And for a while after Scott come back to the concert, it still happened. I felt I had to. I was technically paranoid. It was that weird. I don't know if you've ever heard a description of this from inside. I don't even know what it was. And one guy said, oh, yeah, had a psychotic break. And people know it better. I don't think that's what that was. I don't know. I don't know what happened. I came through on the other side. And even before I've been going down, the students who were watching me fall apart in class, probably because the doctor put me on Parkinson's meds, took me off the ones I should have been on. So that doubled the problem. So I'd have them withdraw from one type at the same time that these others that can make you hallucinate were coming in. I should have had the sense to say, think through the logic, question your doctors. Never mind he's got a great effort, he's fine, but maybe there's a reason. Well, I won't say what had happened because somebody might figure out who it was and I don't want he was a wonderfully nice guy and I remember when I was first taking the office with someone who's worried about how my condition he spent 80 minutes talking to me and this is guy I said I was told that this guy at the, outside the door watching me what's going on I said, Take and he said believe it or not he said normally we'll complain right this guy said this must be a really good doctor because he's giving that much time to a single patient I swear that's what my friends who were taking me there reported. And that's the thing I thought. That's why I trusted him. But the logic didn't make sense. He was operating outside of the field in which he was trained. He was a brain surgeon. 
I made it think you can do anything that has to do with the brain, but this is other stuff. And uh, so he gave me medicine that made me hallucinate, and we thought we were going to start having it. If it had an effect, but I thought it was having an effect because I was hoping. I, mean, I was getting worse and worse. I was probably zoned out on benzos, is what was going on. I was over prescribed by the lead psychiatrist at a certain provincial hospital that everybody defers to. He's a quack, complete quack. I go into his office privately and thinking, you know, get around the system, and, you know, well, I have a real appointment. And, you know, he'd have a meal sometime. If you see him lying down on the bed in his office, hadn't come out. Then we did it. He was the lead psychiatrist at that particular hospital. I wanted to just get a certain medicine. And they started giving me more. I'll try this. I'd give the medicines written in such a way I couldn't tell what the doses were. And I couldn't. I couldn't. I'm going to stop. I finally got somebody to stop. The policeman is concerned. And I'm going to keep this on just in case he decides to give me a hard time and throw me in jail. And we just put this up later. Oh, it's different. It's not going to be the sheriff. This is a different uniform. It's dark, so you can tell. I cannot tell what this car is. Hold on. Hold on. I saw it in the light. It is a different one. The other one was white. This one is dark with the... This might be the state police. This is what I want. The local sheriff... The entire county has only three deputies. Three. No wonder they can't watch this. He's leaving. No, he's coming. He's leaving. No, he's coming. You're not going to hear the story. Sorry. And I may not even have to post this. Great. Sir, my name is... Professor, Dr. Edwin Zaner, Ph.D., Cornell University. Where's Is that your car down there? That's my car. Okay, back up a little bit. You, get you can back car. up. Huh? You can back up. Now, I you, don't have COVID anymore. You're walking on the interstate, which is illegal, okay? If I, you I told you this might happen. Okay. I, my phone doesn't work. The police called a wreck wrecker and said he'd be here in 30 minutes is now more than two hours later okay. uh, i tried to flag down trucks to zipping on past have i okay you're out here at night they probably can't see you until it's too late sir yes sir what can i, I do see your id okay my id yes, disappeared okay during the week i thought it was in the, my california driver's license which was in my wallet i used it to check in okay. disappeared you want to see the empty spot no i don't want to don't just, just believe me it's there Sir, you can touch my pockets. I do not have any weapons. Okay. I never carry any. Okay. Well, I don't know that. I you don't carry them. You. Look at all that. Yeah. Pretty impressive. I actually, know. Oh, all good. Right. What, so, what are you What are you trying to accomplish walking down the interstate right now? Get to some place where I can go, upload this video, and maybe get somebody to show up. D DVD, the thing video. Is going on. Well, yeah, I'm going to put this up to YouTube or Facebook. I've got 3,600 Facebook friends around the world, but none of them are here, so I'd have to use YouTube because the situation is so ridiculous. What, I've even what's described going on. Tell me what's going on. I need to know. Can you? Okay, the car is broken. What's wrong with the car? Let's Actually, find... the car runs fine. The problem is, I'll show you the object that it hit. Okay, so it hits. It's a police. Yeah. So it's not driving. Well, if we can just catch the last ball, I keep trying to say. And then, the, the previous, how old are you? Twenty-four. He was twenty-one. He's really good at barking people around, but he had no real life experience. It's hard to get him to slow down and listen to one of them. Well, I'm listening to you. It's hard to hear you. And no, 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 no. Uh, I kind of pieced it together. Okay. And at first I couldn't get down on the ground because I had some difficulties with that. And somebody else said, oh, the, the guy, the hitchhiker was with me, who had, I believe, ditched me, saying he was going to go get help. Uh, 